This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. They turn for on strong mandate in the white blinkers. Right on curling at the rail. Tapager is just behind them trying to get out with opportunity. There's an eighth of a mile to go. It's strong mandate right on curling. Now there's room for Tapager and opportunity. Very close quarters. Lots of bumping going on in the final stages. Opportunity. Tapager nose and nose with right on curling. Opportunity puts his head in front of Tapager. Here's the line. Opportunity has won the rebel. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Down the Stretch. I'm Mark Cassano. On this morning's show, trainers making news. Naira makes a pricing announcement. Our three-year-old segment will feature the Rebel Stakes, as well as an updated Derby Dozen. Then we will welcome in two very special guests. First, Mr. Wayne Catalano, who's got both Poker Player and Solitary Ranger for this afternoon's Spiral. He also has Aurelia's Bell for the uh, Bourbon at Oaks. He will be followed by Mr. Jerry Hollendorfer, whose late-running Tamarando will contest the spiral. And Jerry has Swiss Lake Yodler for the Oaks. And we will also get an update on shared belief. So all of that and much, much more if you stay with us for this, our March 22nd edition of the show. Good morning once again. Welcome to our first official show of spring. I don't know about you, but <laughs> the first Saturday of spring doesn't feel much different from winter, at least to me. So I hope this springtime monitor shot brings a smile to your face. Uh, we've got uh, a very, very good show for you this morning, including both Wayne Catalano and Jerry Hollendorfer. But we begin on a sad note. Trainer Dominic Galusio, who successfully plied his trade on the Naira circuit for more than 30 years, died Monday night at the young age of 55. Pancreatic cancer was the cause. Galusio, <clears throat> who saddled his first winner back in 1981, won 1,047 races, most of them on the very tough Naira circuit. And in the claiming game in New York, where the names of those dominating changed like the seasons, Galusio was solid for more than three decades. In my dealings with Dominic, I found him to be both personable and professional, along with being successful. Our sympathies go out to his family and friends, and I will miss seeing him in his colorful sport jackets in the Saratoga Winner's Circle. Donations in Dominic's name can be made to the Backstretch Employee Service Team Best at Belmont Park. The major story this past week, the organization PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, staged a four-month undercover investigation last summer at Saratoga and Churchill Downs. An undercover investigator working in the Steve Asmussen barn, used a hidden camera to record approximately seven hours of video and audio. Now, after reviewing the information which PETA presented to it, the New York Times ran an article on Asmussen and his top assistant, Scott Blossy. PETA has accused the two men of subjecting their horses to, and I am quoting here, cruel and injurious treatments, administering drugs to them for non-therapeutic purposes, and hiring one of their jockeys, excuse me, having one of their jockeys, Ricardo Santana Jr., use an electrical device to shock horses into running faster, end quote. PETA has filed complaints with federal and state authorities here in New York and in Kentucky. Now, PETA also accused Asmussen, and this is being underplayed, and I don't think it should be, of employing undocumented workers 
and conspiring with Blasi to produce false identification documents. If that is true, and if the federal government gets involved, then Mr. Asmussen could have some serious problems. In the past, PETA has gone over the top, becoming irrational with certain you know, issues regarding racing, such as the Gabriel Saez eight bells situation a few years ago in the Kentucky Derby. But this may be different. It feels different to me. Yesterday, the Executive Committee of the National Museum of Racing and Hall of Fame unanimously decided to pull Steve Asmussen's name from the ballot. He was one of ten names up for election to racing's highest honor. But, according to a release from the museum, and it reads, and I'm quoting, based on pending investigations by the New York State Gaming Commission and the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission into allegations made by people for the ethical treatment of animals and reported by various media outlets, the National Museum of Racing and Hall of Fame has decided it is in its best interests of the institution and the sport of thoroughbred racing in general to table the 2014 Hall of Fame nomination of trainer Steve Asmussen. Now tabling means that he is off the ballot this year, but potentially eligible, depending on the nominating committee, to be on future ballots. Folks, you've got to understand, Asmussen has been eligible to be on the ballot for several years. But up until this year, the nominating committee declined to put him on the ballot. Now, why it changed this year is known only to the nominating committee. The executive committee at the museum took Asmussen off the ballot because they felt they had to. I mean, had he been elected, it would have been a public relations nightmare. Now, there's 185 voters, of which I am one. I learned that as of Thursday afternoon, after the story had broken, 28 ballots had been received. And about half of them, 12 to 14, folks inquired about changing their vote, meaning that in all likelihood, those ballots including, included Asmussen's name. Now, Zayat Stables announced all of their horses running this weekend who are trained by Asmussen will be scratched. Winchell Thoroughbreds, who has tapature with Asmussen, their racing manager, David Fisk, was quoted as saying, we will assess the situation, do what's best for us, not entirely sure what that is at the moment, end quote. You know, I think all of us folks have to take a step back right now and take a deep breath. For those of you who watched the video, and it was very troubling, remember, that's only, I, I don't remember exactly what it was, seven, eight, nine minutes worth of video that came from four months of investigative work and a total of seven hours of video. So there was a great deal of editing done. Let's let the authorities, let's let this run its course. I think the museum did what they felt they had to do as far as taking Asmussen off the ballot. And again, this is just my opinion. Personally, I think the most overlooked part of this story, if it's true about the false identification and the false documents, and the federal government gets involved. You know, we know that racing through the decades, as far as doling out punishment, it's been rather random. And until Rick Dutrow got 10 years, it really hasn't been terribly serious. But if the federal government gets involved, that could all change. The New York Racing Association re recently announced several price changes concerning Belmont Stakes Day and Saratoga. On Belmont Day, grandstand admission will remain at $10, while clubhouse admission has been increased by $10 to $30. Naira also announced that about 30% of all reserved seats on Belmont Day would be equal to or less than they cost last year. So logically, that means about 70% of all seats will have higher costs this year. Now concerning Saratoga. Grandstand and clubhouse admission 
will go up to $5 and $8 for every day except Travers Day when it will be $10 and $15. Reserve seats at Saratoga with a deadline of April 15th, for those of you who participate in what they refer to as a lottery, appear to be going up as well. When I check the application online, the clubhouse reserve seats I got for friends last year, which cost $16 a piece for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in the clubhouse. Well, those are now $18. And those seats on Travers Day, which last year were $25, this year will be $35. In an interview we did with Naira President Chris Kay, it was early this year or late last year, he talked about developing a sustainable business model, one which doesn't rely on the VLT revenue stream. And folks, that means there will be increasing certain prices even though Naira is a not-for-profit. Now, the day after the Travers, Sunday, August 24th, will be Saratoga Showcase Day, a card which will include six New York bread stakes races as Naira looks to bolster the New York bread program, and that is very, very good news. Now, three of the top older horses in training have their sights set on their next starts. Wise Dan to your far left, the reigning two-time horse of the year, is being pointed toward the April 11th Makers 46 Mile at Keeneland, the same race which kicked off his 2013 season. Game on Dude in the middle, who recently made history by capturing the Santanita handicap for the third time, will go next in the $1.5 million Charlestown Classic on April 19th. Game on Dude won that race last year, despite not handling the track very well. And Palace Malice, to your far right, who began his 2014 campaign with a game, hard-fought victory in the Gulfstream Park handicap, will go next in the New Orleans handicap next Saturday, as originally planned, where he will likely face, among others, Normandy Invasion. That could be a beauty. I mentioned last week, we'll take charge. We'll go next in the April 12th Oaklawn Handicap, and it appears as though Princess of Silmar will make her four-year-old debut in the April 6th Cat K Stakes at Aqueduct as she heads toward a potential showdown with Beholder and Close Hatches in the $1 million Ogden Phipps on June 7th at Belmont Park. And finally in this segment, 50 to 1, the Mind That Bird story had its world premiere Wednesday night in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The movie is, of course, based on the 2009 Kentucky Derby winner and his connections, who shocked the racing world five years ago. Calvin Burrell, who rode Mind That Bird, plays himself in the movie. And I'm going to make an educated guess about the movie. I say it will be more accurate than Disney's interpretation of Secretariat. And we are up to our first break on this March 22nd edition of the show. Thank you so much for having joined us. When we return, it's our three-year-old segment. As we go to the break last Saturday at Oaklawn, the Azari. And the three to five favorite, number one, the aforementioned Close Hatches, making her first start since a fine second in last year's Breeders' Cup Distaff. So we will take a look at the Azari to the break, back with our three-year-old segment right after these messages. And they're off in the Azari on fire, baby, wasting no time, blasting out right on top, Sister Ginger. Close Hatches wasn't quick out of there, but she's fastest of them all going into the first turn and takes the lead. Magic Union is now a joint second as Close Hatches went very wide around that turn. It's Magic Union on Fire Baby side by side, second and third. Sister Ginger is in fourth, about seven lengths off the heavy favorite. Dixie Strike, Flashy American, and Don't Tell Sophia's at the back. Onto the back stretch they go and Close Hatches leads it by a length. 
on fire, baby, on the outside of Magic Union. Another three back to Sister Ginger in fourth. Flashy American inches a bit closer. She's followed by Dixie Strike. Don't Tell Sophia begins her move a little bit early as she tries to chase down Close Hatches, who's uncontested up top, heading to the half-mile pole in the Azeri. On fire, baby, and Magic Union have been side-by-side -side the entire journey. Don't Tell Sophia moves up on the outside of Sister Ginger. Dixie Strike is at the rail. She has five to make up. Flashy American is now last. Close Hatches leads by a length midway on the far turn. She's doing it stylishly. On Fire Baby is under pressure now. Magic Union running a good one. Don't tell Sophia's asked for more. They're at the top of the stretch. Close Hatches in control. Don't tell Sophia unleashed on the outside. On Fire Baby is in between them. They're followed by Magic Union. There's an eighth of a mile to go. Close Hatches clinging to the lead. Don't tell Sophia coming after her. And Magic Union on the fence. Then On Fire Baby. Don't tell Sophia trying to get to Close Hatches late. But Close Hatches has something left. And it's Close Hatches in front running fashion to win the Azeri. A solid second for Magic Union. Don't tell Sophia third. On Fire Baby was fourth. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. I got it. Watch me. I got it. Hey! I got something that makes me want to shout. I got something that tells me what it's all about. I got a move that tells me what to do. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Asano and close hatches for Bill Mott and Joel Wazario, wire to wire by a length and a quarter over long shot Magic Union to win the Azari. You know, even with Beholder and Princess of Silmar out there, it should be a big year for close hatches who will likely go next in the Apple Blossom on her way to the Ogden Phipps. Our three year old segment begins with news that the Philly only for you had to be euthanized after a training accident last Saturday at Palm Meadows in Florida. She suffered a congular fracture. Only for you was undefeated in four career starts, including the Devona Dale and the forward gal. Trainer Art Sherman has announced that California Chrome will run next in the April 5th Santa Anita Derby. Until recently, Sherman was undecided whether to run his cowbred colt another time before the Kentucky Derby. Personally, I am happy with this decision. And Social Inclusion, who thrashed Honor Code by 10 lengths while setting a Gulfstream track record recently, worked a half mile in 49 seconds this morning at Gulfstream Park. But as of this moment, no decision has been made as to where he will run next. It will likely be either the Florida Derby or the Wood Memorial. Now, owner Ron Sanchez, as far as we know, has not sold social inclusion yet. We've been trying to reach Sanchez for several days, but apparently he's taking calls from folks with $10 million or more. Also working this morning at Gulfstream for the Florida Derby, Wildcat Red and General A-Rod, and Honor Code worked for the Wood Memorial. And Mexicoma, who finished a late closing third in his 2014 debut in a good February allowance at Gulfstream, has been removed from consideration for the Kentucky Derby. Mexicoma will be pointed for the June 7th Belmont Stakes, with a prep race likely coming in the May 10th Peter Pan. And finally, Bondholder, winner of last year's frontrunner stakes and fourth in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, has been battling laminitis. He has been at a Florida clinic for the past two weeks, and his trainer, Doug O'Neill, said that things have been going pretty well. All right, our major three-year-old race 
of the week past, the Rebel, last Saturday at Oaklawn, rain left the racetrack as wet fast and sealed the slight favorite at 2-1, to one, number 3, Tapature, the winner of the Southwest, also at 2-1, to one, number 4, Strong Mandate, second in the Southwest. Remember, he had lost some training time going into the Southwest, didn't get the cleanest of trips. At 3-1 to one was number 8, Kobe's back, outstanding as a closing sprinter, but it's fair to say somewhat questionable around two turns. And the fourth choice at 6-1, to one, number 5, Hopportunity, a distant fourth in the Risen Star and last. For the call of the Rebel, here's Frank Miramati. Set for the Rebel. And they're off. Kobe's back was off just a step slowly. Strong mandate breaks alertly, right on Curlin, Tapature in between them, opportunity up close through the opening furlong. Street strategy is widest of all into the first turn. Shelterwee's boy goes over to the rail, then it's Jet Cat, and Kobe's back is racing about five wide, and he's tough to handle through the opening furlongs. Right on Curlin, strong mandate. Strong mandate has his head in front. Opportunity, perfect trip, third. Street strategy is just outside of him, and Tapature relaxes nicely, only three lengths off this soft, early tempo. Kobe's back is going for an early bid. He's on the outside of Jet Cat, and that leaves Sheltui's boy at the back. Down the back stretch they go. Joel Rosario and Strong Mandate carving out the fractions, three quarters of a length. Right on Curlin, second. Opportunity within a length, third. Tapature is eager on the inside. He's got some run in fourth, two and a half lengths off the leader. Street strategy is outside of him. Then it's Sheltui's boy. Kobe's back has eight to make up, and Jet Cat drops out. Around the far turn, strong mandate, ride on Curlin on even terms. Just behind them, opportunity third. Tapature needs some racing room. Tapature is loaded coming to the quarter pole. Street strategy hard ridden. Kobe's back was never comfortable. They turn for own strong mandate in the white blinkers. Right on Curlin at the rail. Tapature is just behind them trying to get out. With opportunity, there's an eighth of a mile to go. It's strong mandate right on Curlin. Now there's room for Tapature and opportunity very close quarters, lots of bumping going on in the final stages. Opportunity, Tapature nose and nose with right on Curlin. Opportunity puts his head in front of Tapature. Here's the line. Opportunity has won the Rebel. Opportunity shipping into Oaklawn off a non-threatening fourth in the Risen Star and last. Survived a bumping incident with Tapature in the lane, then survived the steward's inquiry to upset the Rebel by a half length giving Bob Baffert his fourth win in the last five runnings of the Rebel. Tapature finished the game second. Long shot ride on Curlin wound up a stubborn third, while Strong Mandate finished a, in my opinion, no excuse fourth. With a wet fast track sealed and the pace conservative, you had to be reasonably close to the pace, and the first four finishers were just that. While he showed very little early speed, in the Risen Star and last, Opportunity was ideally situated throughout the eight and a half furlongs of the Rebel. As Strong Mandate, racing well off the rail, where the going was best, dictated the pace. Ride on Curlin, caught on the inside, the worst part of the track, had to hold his position inside while Mike Smith aboard the winner was in the garden spot. Tapature, who had relaxed nicely while making the lead in the southwest, was a little hard to handle early in here while in behind the leaders, but would settle better mid-backstretch. But Ricardo Santana Jr. here found himself in a pocket with nowhere to go. And as the Rebel field straightened for home, Santana took Tapature off the inside. He bulled his way between strong mandate and opportunity. And despite exchanging several bumps with the winner through the lane, I thought had every chance to win. As I mentioned, the winner marked the fourth time in the last five years that Baffert has shipped a Southern California-based three-year-old to Oaklawn and won the Rebel. Now, is this a coincidence? I think not. Generally speaking, despite the large purse for the Rebel, 600,000, the overall strength of Rebel Fields has been suspect. And Opportunity didn't exactly have great credentials coming into the Rebel. He had won only a Santa Anita maiden race at 6-1. to one. And I went back and took a look at his fourth in the Risen Star. 
And while he didn't get the best of trips that day, he was just behind the eventual winner in Tense Holiday with about three-eighths of a mile to go and got beat seven lengths. Now, young three-year-olds improve in leaps and bounds quickly at this time of year, and maybe that's what happened to Opportunity, or it might have been the track, the pace, and the quality of the opposition may have better suited him. In defeat, Tapature didn't lose much in my eyes, although even as you watch that head-on of the stretch run, I didn't think he had that much of an excuse. Once he got out, I thought he had every chance to win. Strong mandate, unless he hated that racetrack. And of course, that's a possibility, but we've got to remember that to date, Strong Mandate's biggest win came over that very wet track last year at Saratoga and the Travers. So I don't know about hating this racetrack because he had absolutely no excuse. He was in the best part of the racetrack. He controlled the pace. The pace was conservative. You know, I just didn't see any excuse at all. Kobe's back will likely go back to sprinting while street strategy needs more experience. I thought right on Curlin ran well. Um, considering that he was down on the worst part of the racetrack. While it appears as though Tapature, Ride on Curlin, and Strong Mandate will all come back for the Arkansas Derby, I'm not sure Opportunity's going to. Now, he may, but Baffert's got a very talented colt in his barn named Byron who desperately needs Kentucky Derby points. Bayern's going to run next in either the Arkansas Derby or the Santa Anita Derby. I mean, unless Baffert doesn't want to ship, you would think the Arkansas Derby would be an easier spot for Bayern to get points rather than the Santa Anita Derby. The final running time for the Rebel Stakes stacked up quite well against the other eight and a half furlong stakes run last Saturday at Oaklawn. Let's take a look at the internal fractions and the final running times. The Razorback was for older males, the Rebel, of course, for three-year-olds, and the Azari for older females. As you can see, the early fractions in the Rebel were quite conservative, substantially slower than the Razorback. The quarter was 85 one hundred slower, the half mile 1.07 seconds slower, three quarters 71 one hundred slower, the mile was 38 one hundred slower, the final time only ended up being 18 one hundred slower than the Razorback. As far as the Azari, it was two thirds of a second slower to the opening quarter, 54 one hundred slower to the half, and then the Rebel pace started to pick up and actually the final running time was 44 one hundredths faster than the Azari. So actually when you look at this, and I'm not saying that the Razorback and the Azari had too many killers in them, although I think Close Hatches is a very, very nice filly, but you can see where the final running time of the Rebels stacked up very nicely against the races for the older horses. Now, I don't know how much that racetrack changed, but you know those races were run within, what, 90 minutes of each other, so you wouldn't think it changed that much. But uh, a nice performance from the winner, Opportunity. Again, I went back and took a look at his last start in the Risen Star. I did not see any excuse in the Risen Star. So he's either making major strides or he found a field that he really liked. All right, the Rebel, the only major three-year-old race last week. How did that impact our Derby Dozen? As we take a look on the morning of March 22nd, we are only six weeks out from the first Saturday in May. Strong Mandate, who was number seven on my list last week, is out of the top 12. At number one, remaining number one, is Cairo Prince. He will make his first start in nine weeks in next Saturday's Florida Derby. Remaining number two is Candy Boy. He will go next in the Santa Anita Derby in two weeks. Remaining number three is California Chrome. He will run in the Santa Anita Derby instead of training to the Kentucky Derby. 
Honor Code, who worked this morning at Gulfstream, he remains number four. The Wood Memorial in two weeks, likely to be his next start. Bayern moves up to number five from number six. The Santa Anita Derby or the Arkansas Derby next. At number six is Intense Holiday, up two spots. He will run in the Louisiana Derby next Saturday. And number seven is the undefeated New York Brett Samrock. He moves up two spots. He will go next in the Wood Memorial in two weeks. Tapature drops from number five to number eight. He will stay at Oaklawn for the Arkansas Derby. Whether he will be trained by Steve Asmussen is a, is a major question at this point. Hopportunity makes his first appearance at number nine. Arkansas Derby, Santa Anita Derby, you know, he will likely go wherever Bayern doesn't go. At number 10 is social inclusion. He remains at 10, Florida Derby or Wood. At 11 is Constitution, lightly raced unbeaten for Pletcher, next Saturday's Florida Derby, which whether or not social inclusion goes, will likely have sufficient early speed. And finally, Kid Cruz remains number 12, the Wood Memorial up next for that late running Linda Rice trainee. So there's a look at our updated Derby Dozen as of the first Saturday of spring. And we are up to our next break. When we return, it's off to Kentucky, where we will welcome Mr. Wayne Catalano. As we go to the break, the grade one Santa Margarita. Not a single grade one winner in the race. The seven to five favorite, number seven, Iotapa. So we will take a look at the Santa Margarita to the break. Back with Wayne Catalano right after these messages. And uh, away they go. Along the inside, 50 Shades of Hay. Let Faith Arise is showing speed as well. Macha racing up between there. Ayo Tapper's on the outside, now going up third. Extreme outside here. Hill was going to be caught a little wide into the turn. Stanwick is racing right there with him. And last of all, a spellbound six lengths would cover the lot. The rest tightly bunched as they head past the 7 8 50 shades of hay. Got a relatively easy lead, not in a hurry out here. Up alongside is Let Faith Arise. A close up third comes Aya Tapper. Still, your hill were caught a little wide, going up alongside of the leaders, though. Four of them tightly grouped. Mocker has a good spot down at the rail, and Stanwick's traveling nicely in six. Only three lengths covering all those runners. And then there's a gap of six back to Spellbound. They head to the 5 8 pole, 50 shades of hay along the inside. Let Faith arise between them. Stanwick is right there too. Your hill were on the far side. Mocker scrapes the paint just two lengths off these leaders, and Stanwick is still comfortable. Only three lengths still covers all those runners. And a gap of five back to Spellbound. Into the turn they go in the Santa Margarita. 50 shades of hay now pushed along. Let Faith arise on the far side. Io Tapper. Your hill were extreme outside Stalwick, and now Spellbound's coming fast from last. Taking an early run, can she keep going? Spellbound's coming fast, gonna have to go wide. They're at the top of the lane. Let Faith arise. Io Tapper's right there. Stanwick now looking for room. Spellbound extreme outside. They come for home. And it is Let Faith Arise and Io Tapper. Stanwick is chasing them from third. Let Faith Arise keeps on finding on the inside. And Let Faith Arise, a scintillating performance today. Let Faith Arise and Cory Nakatani won the Santa Margarita. Io Tapper was second. Stanwick finished third. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting.
Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Cassano. Let faith arise for Jerry Hollendorfer and Corey Nakatani by a solid length and three quarters over Iotapa to win her first ever graded stakes in the grade one Santa Margarita. Our first guest this morning has a pair, poker player and solitary ranger for the Spiral, as well as Aurelia's Bell for the Bourbon at Oaks. We welcome in live via telephone from Kentucky, Mr. Wayne Catalano. Wayne Marcusano, welcoming you back to Down the Stretch. Ah, uh, thanks, Mark. Always nice Pleasure to have you, Wayne. With... Let's begin with Poker Player. And as we take a look at him rallying to win last year's Off the Turf Bourbon at Keeneland. And for our audience, as we pick it up, he's third from last on the fence in the pink silks. Wayne is a two-year-old. It appeared you thought of him as a grass runner. That's true. You know, he has some grass pedigree, and uh, we thought that he would do well on it. He runs Focus Maiden, I guess, at Kentucky Downs on the grass. Wayne, whether it's turf or synthetic, it appears as though poker player prefers to settle early and make a late run. That's correct. We just didn't want him back so far last time. The kickback was very, very hard on him, and he didn't know what to do with that. He was jumping up and down and kind of got himself out of the race. Wayne, and so We're hoping that they do it a little better today. In a moment, we're going to have a shot of poker player on the screen. Would you please describe him physically for our audience? And has he changed much from two to three? He has. He developed, and you know, he filled out, and he got a little taller and uh, matured a little bit. Uh, we hoping that uh, he puts everything together today and uh, handles the kickback a little better, and the extra ground should do him some good. Wayne, your decision to run him in today's spiral. What was somewhat of a last-minute decision? Why, in the end, did you decide to run? Well, you know, we spoke it all over with Mr. West and Benny Glass, and um, the way the race come off, you know, the distance, the purse, and we thought it was a, a good shot that we would uh, – our chances would be better today going a mile and eight against these horses and the one coming up at Keelan. Wayne, he has never run on dirt. If poker players should earn enough Kentucky Derby points this afternoon in the spiral, is he being considered for the Kentucky Derby? I would say uh, they would consider it. Even though he's never run on dirt. Has he ever trained on dirt? He has. And how's he handled yeah. it? He handled it good. He handled it good. You know, I'll handle the one thing, and you don't know until you run them. So that's what we'll be doing. Wayne, let's move to Solitary Ranger. And in a moment, we're going to take a look at him win the Battaglia Memorial in last for our audience. Solitary Ranger is number two in here. And by the way, he will defeat Poker Player, who is number one. Wayne, for the most part, Solitary Ranger has been a synthetic track specialist. Yes, he has, but, you know, we, uh, we we can't wait to get him back on the turf somewhere along the line. Uh, we want to get through today's race. We, we're taking a shot with the distance. We're thinking he's kind of limited. Limitation is the distance, so we'll find out today. Wayne, he won the Arlington-Washington Futurity last year as a maiden, so I'm guessing you were pretty high on him from early on. Yes, he was training very, very well, and um, you know, coming up to that race, and um, we've done it in the past, so we tried to do it again, and it worked. Wayne, you mentioned a moment ago, and you've been quoted as saying, "Solitary Ranger, you feel has some distance limitations." I mean, what do you think they are? Are are you thinking that nine furlongs might be tough for him? Do you think a mile and a quarter might be tough for him? Specifically, what are your major concerns about the distance? Well, the mile and eight is going to be a test today. We're testing him today, but once again, the race is there. He's done over that surface. He handled it very well. If he's ever going to get it, a shot at it, today's the day. I mean, he's got a very big purse, and uh, we've tried a mile and eight against a big purse like that rather than a $100,000 purse somewhere else. Wayne, considering that you are concerned about the distance, 
Will he be ridden any differently this afternoon? I mean, he's got a lot of natural speed. Those have come at shorter distances. I mean, do you want your rider to try to get him to relax and settle, or do you want him in front this afternoon? Well, what, 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 the way we see the race, he may be in front. If they let him go easy, of course, it's going to give him a better opportunity to last the distance. Uh, but we'll play it by ear. He'll come from right off the pace like he did when he broke his maiden in all the Washington for 30. So we'll just have to see how the race unfolds. But he's very, very fast in racing the game. Now, considering he has never run on dirt and the distance concerns you have, should he earn enough Kentucky Derby points this afternoon? Is he being seriously considered for the run for the Roses? I, I think the lady who owns it would consider it, but she's more uh, thinking the Preakness, if we can get in that, in that situation, if we can set ourselves up more for the Preakness, probably what we would like. But uh, obviously, you know, if you get points for the Derby and everything's well, he's worked very, very good on the dirt at the background. Who knows? You know, I mean, once again, you don't know till you run them. They all grass horses till they prove it not, and they all dirt till they prove it not. In today's Bourbonette Oaks on the Spiral Undercard, you will be running Aurelia's Bell coming out of a third in the Devona Dale at Gulfstream. For our audience, as we pick it up, Aurelia's Bell number four in third. Wayne, talk to us about your filly. Well, it's a very, very nice filly. She, you know, the, the track bias was against uh, the races that we run against. You know, speed was very dangerous at golf streams, as everybody knows. And uh, she worked very, very well here the other day at Keelan over the poly. She broke a maiden over the poly. And we're expecting a big race out of a very nice filly today. Wayne, you have, uh, I don't know if replaced is the proper word, but Joe Rocco Jr., who rode her in the Devona Dale in last, is not riding her today, and he is at Turfway. Did he do something in the Devona Dale you didn't like? No, he, he, he didn't. I, I like Joe Rocco a lot. He's a very good rider. He's a nice young upcoming rider. We had some success with him. But in this case, uh, we're going back to Channing Hill, who won on the Philly, and the opportunity was there. He's coming in to ride poker player. So we uh, elected to go that way with him. Well, Wayne, as always, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. All the best with poker player and solitary ranger in the spiral and with Aurelia's Bell in the Oaks, and we'll look forward to speaking with you again very soon. Thank you, sir. It's always a pleasure. Mark. Thank Take you, care. Wayne. Wayne Catalano, ladies and gentlemen, and we are up to our next break. When we return, Mr. Jerry Hollendorfer will join us as we go to the break. Last Saturday's Honey Fox at Gulfstream, 5-2 to two favorite, number 7, Tappacat. Although four fillies in here were between 5-2 to two and 7-2. to two. Wide open race on paper. We'll take a look at the Honey Fox to the break. Back with Jerry Hollendorfer right after these messages. They're racing in the Honey Fox. Center court had a very good start. So did run a risk, and from the inside, it's Effie Trinket with early speed. And right in there, too, is Triple Arch as they race for the turn. And then it's Triple Charm. Paranda's on the far outside. After that, Tap a Cat, and the trailer on the first turn is Kitten's Point. Effie Trinket on top three quarters of a length. Triple Arch running in second. Runner Risk is third to the outside. Then Triple Charm Paranda's in fifth. Center court is sixth. Four lengths off the lead just ahead of Tapacat. And Kitten's Point is last. 23 and 3 was the opening quarter mile. They race on the back stretch. Triple Arch on the outside. Effie Trinket at the rail. They match strides on the lead. Runner Risk, Triple Charm, and Paranda lined up right behind them. Then it's Tapacat inside of center court. And still last is Kitten's Point. Only five lengths separate the entire field after a 47 flat half mile. Racing for the turn in the Honey Fox, Effie Trinket and Triple Arch are locked in battle. They're nose to nose on the lead. Paranda third on the far outside. Triple Charm has the rail. Center court circles up four wide. Tapacat is there. Runner risk is dropped back. And then Kitten's Point. They're coming toward the top of the stretch. Effie Trinket. Comes a bit wide, turns for home in front. Triple Arch, here's center court, down the center. Tapacat is there, and Triple...
Triple Charm is trying to run on late. It's center court. Center court has taken the lead. Effie Trinket, Kittens Point flying on the far outside. Center court. Center court and Kittens Point on the wire together. Then Effie Trinket and Triple Charm. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Funding your Capital OTB Bet account is as easy as one, two, three. One, easy money. Clearly the fastest and easiest method of depositing funds into your account. Make deposits or withdrawals in just minutes. Two, Green Dot Money Pack gives you instant access to your funds. Green Dot Money Packs are available at thousands of retailers nationwide. And three, MasterCard Visa. Simply click on the link from the funding page, enter your account information, and fund your account. CapitalOTBPet.com. Log on today. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Asano. My thanks to Wayne Catalano once again for having joined us. In center court for Rusty Arnold and Julian Leperu, despite breaking through the gate prior to the start, edges Kitten's Point by a nose to capture the Honey Fox. Her form went bad the latter half of last year, but they found out that she had a pulled muscle, so hopefully center court is back on track. Our final guest this morning will be saddling Tamarando for the Spiral as well as Swiss Lake Yodler for the Oaks. We welcome in live via telephone Mr. Jerry Hollendorfer, Jerry Marcasano, welcoming you back to Down the Stretch. Thank you. Nice to have you as always, Jerry. Before we get to today's stake starters, I want to talk about your champion, Shared Belief. Here he is for our audience, number six in route to the big victory in last year's Hollywood Futurity. Jerry, he's been on the sidelines since this race. Remind us, remind our audience, what's been going on with Shared Belief? Well, we've been working on a foot problem that he had. Fortunately for him, uh, he's now over that, and uh, we have him uh, back on the racetrack at Golden Gate Fields, and uh, he's uh, really uh, training well. Jerry, as you mentioned, he's at Golden Gate. You took him to Northern California. Is that because the synthetic surface might be easier on his feet? Well, he didn't have a problem there. He started out there, and he didn't have a problem there, so I took him back to the place where he didn't have a problem. Jerry, if he continues to progress at a normal rate, about how long do you think it would take you to have him back, you know, to a fitness level where he's ready to race again? Well, I don't know, you know, because, uh, you know, it seems like he hasn't lost that much. But, you know, we didn't train him for quite a while. So it seems like he hasn't lost that much. When we get to the yeah, output him a, a few more days and get a breeze in him, then I'll know more where I'm at with him. But... I'm not worried about that. Eventually, if uh, we keep him sound, uh, then he'll make it back to the race. And he can run uh, either short or long. So if I have to start him back short, uh, then I would do that. Jerry, has he changed much physically since we last saw him on the racetrack? Yeah, as with most horses, uh, a, a break, uh, a break and, and some time off. Uh, uh, allows the horse to gain a little bit of weight, and I'm uh, sure that uh, he looks a little a bit fuller uh, since he's had the time off. We are really looking forward to shared belief getting back to the races. Let's move on to Tamarando for today's spiral. Here he is rallying to a victory in his last start in the El Camino Real Derby. For our audience, he is number four in the red cap, rallying wide. Jerry, talk about this very consistent colt. Well, he is uh, very consistent, and especially on uh, synthetic surface, which is one, one of the reasons uh, why, why he's here. Uh, he's uh, uh, run ten times, and he's been in the money nine. So he's very, very consistent. So if we can get a decent trip today, we think that we have a, 
a chance to win and, and a chance to be in the money. Jerry, you mentioned, and, and, and you know, in this day and age, this is borderline stunning that here we are in, well, March 22nd, and he's already run 10 times. I assume that means he's a very sound racehorse. Well, he has been up until this point, so, I mean, he's trained very forwardly, and we haven't felt like he needed a, a break. So, uh, you know, here he is going to make his 11th start. You mentioned you chose the spiral in part because it is synthetic. Jerry's run well on dirt in the past. If he should earn enough Kentucky Derby points in this afternoon's spiral, are you seriously considering the run for the roses for him? Oh, uh, yeah. You know, if he can get in, then I, I'm sure that uh, Larry Williams and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Williams would, would like to run in the Derby again. Uh, we ran rousing sermons for them in, in the Derby, and if uh, he got us enough points to get in, I'm, I'm sure that Larry would want to run. In today's Bourbon at Oaks on the Spiral Undercard, you run Swiss Lake Yodler, third most recently in the Santa Isabel. Here she is for our audience. She is number four, third on the outside. Jerry, talk about her if you would. Okay, well, you know, another reason why she's here is uh, she only ran once on synthetic and won. So we're, we're thinking that she did uh, like the surface, and uh, she's run uh, well enough against good enough horses to get a chance to run in a race like the Bourbonette. So we know there's a lot of competition in both races, and, uh, uh, you know, we know we need to uh, have some, some luck. But here again, you know, we think we brought up Philly that fits, and uh, and so we think she'll run very well. You're wheeling her back in just three weeks and shipping. How's she doing coming into the race? She looks fine, uh, acting fine at the barn, so you can't ask for her anything more than that. And finally, before we let you go, Sahara Sky, good to see him back. We saw him overcome all kinds of traffic trouble to win the recent San Carlos. Jerry, i got to ask you, when they turned for home that day, did you think he had much of a chance to win? I, I really, uh, you know, I really didn't, and they weren't calling him, and I, was, I had two other horses in the race, and, and I was looking. Uh, I, they were calling Wild Dude, and I was looking to see where he was, and I thought he was going to win, and, and I was looking for z -Watt. <laughs> and I saw that Sahara Sky was uh, trapped on the rail in the back, and then somehow Joel got him out, and uh, and he ended up uh, running him down. So, uh, you know, good good effort. And that, uh, that that horse is a horse. When he wants to run, he runs, and and when he doesn't want to run, he won't run. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, what's next for him? Are we going to see him back here in the East for the Carter and the Met? Well, I don't know about the Met because that's after the Carter. But, you know, I think we're, we're going to look very hard at the Carter. Uh, he ran well in that race last year and maybe was unlucky to lose it. Uh, and so we're going to look at that again. And uh, and our point race would be the uh, would be the Metropolitan Mile, but we want to have a race in between. And this looks like the one, at least timely wise, uh, that fits us the best. How did he come out of the San Carlos? How's he doing? Very well, you know, doing well. Looks good. Training training well, and and uh, he, the, for this particular horse, you could tell by the way that he that he trains. Uh, how he's doing just when he when he wants to go around there you know he, he's doing good and when he when he does it you might as well give him time off jerry as always we appreciate your time thank you so much for having joined us this morning on down the stretch all the best with tamarando and swift swiss lake yodler later this afternoon all the best bringing shared belief back we'll look forward to sahara sky coming back east and we'll look forward to speaking with you again very soon Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Jerry. Jerry Hollendorfer, ladies and gentlemen. This afternoon's spiral is a uh, fascinating race. Let's take a look at the large field 
for this afternoon's Grade 3 $550,000 spiral stakes at a mile and an eighth on synthetic. The speed appears to be Solitary Ranger, who went wire to wire in each of his last two starts, one on a yielding turf course and the last in the Battaglia, which you saw. You heard Wayne Catalano talk about, you know, there is a concern distance-wise for Solitary Ranger. So we'll see if, uh, if in fact, he makes the front and if, in fact, he can back things down. Now, other speed is expected to come from the Colt, who I like to spring a little upset in here, and that is number nine, almost famous. I want to take you back to the January 25th Holy Bull Stakes. As we pick it up down the backside, almost famous is number four. He is pressing a very fast pace, at least a, a, a quick pace, 23 and 3, 46 and 3. Now, the other speed horses in this race, Coup de Gras, who had just packed it in, as well as Mr. Speaker, ended up finishing 10th and 7th, respectively, in here. Now, the thing that I liked about this effort is, even though Almost Famous is going to fade in the lane to 4th, beaten 7 lengths, he held in there pretty well, considering that trainer Pat Byrne did not have him as fit and as tight. You know, he was using the Holy Bull to get to the Fountain of Youth. So I didn't think this effort was bad at all, and it came against some pretty good horses. I think they were substantially better than the horses he faces today. Now, in the Fountain of Youth, he ran 11th, beaten 24. So for those of you sitting out there saying, have you lost your mind? You know, he beat one horse that day and got beat a pole. Got to remember something. At the start of the race, he got shut off completely. When you have a free running horse, a horse with natural speed, and they get shut off early, it doesn't surprise me that he just kind of went around there. Almost Famous has never run on synthetic. And that is a concern for me. But I've got him priced at six or seven to one. I'm willing to take a shot at that kind of price. If he was two or two and a half or three, it's not worth taking a shot. But at the anticipated six or seven, it may be. Now, I don't know if he's going to handle synthetic. I rarely bet synthetic tracks. But I'll tell you what, his damn wild gams won twice on synthetic. And while I don't remember which races they were, they had to be pretty good because she won over 600,000 winning those two synthetic races. Calvin Burrell is drawn outside of the main speed being Solitary Ranger. I'm going to pick Almost Famous to provide a minor upset in this afternoon's Spiral stakes. All right, let's wrap things up. Time to thank all the folks who helped get this week's show on the air here at the studios at the Clubhouse Racebook in Albany. Our associate producer, Julie Hoxie, Brian Dorenzo, and Mick Richards. Back in the control room in Schenectady, Pat Peretta directed, Dan Hayes on audio. Thanks to this morning's guests, Wayne Catalano and Jerry Hollendorfer. And as always, thanks to you for having joined us next Saturday, a very big day. It's Dubai World Cup Day, lots of money on the line with very little U.S. participation. We've got the Florida Derby where Cairo Prince will likely be the favorite and the horse to beat. We've got the Louisiana Derby with intense holiday. We're going to try to get Karen McLaughlin on next week to talk about Cairo Prince. So uh, it's going to be a big, big upcoming Saturday, and let's hope by next Saturday, it feels more like spring. So ladies and gentlemen, as always, thank you so much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. Enjoy all the racing action from coast to coast here this weekend at Capitol. Have a wonderful upcoming week. And from all of us here at Down the Stretch, we'll see you next week.
You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off Track Betting.